I'm pleased to be joined today by Dr. Frank von Hippel. He is a professor of ecotoxicology and environmental health sciences at the University of Arizona. He hosts his own successful podcast, the Science History Podcast, and he's the author of The Chemical Age, which we're going to be talking about today. One more fun fact, Frank is the brother of Bill von Hippel, who I interviewed on this podcast uh, a little over a year ago. Frank, welcome to the Nature and Nurture podcast. Thank you, Adam. I really appreciate the invitation. So Frank, since you're interested in science history, I want to go off topic for a moment and ask you if you've heard about the planarian controversy. <laughs> the plan well, I know what planaria are. Tell me about the planarian controversy. So this is in the 1950s and 60s. A memory researcher, James McConnell, was doing experiments on planarians. And for those who don't know, planarians are these small flatworms less than a centimeter long. And he was doing classical conditioning experiments on them. So like exposing them to a shock and pairing it with light. And when they got shock, they would curl up in self-defense and they learned to curl up in response to light. So even though they're so tiny, they could learn, which is pretty cool. And planarians are also one of these animals that can regenerate. So, and they have, despite their small size, a centralized nervous system. So they have a brain. And if you chop off their head, they can still learn and they'll regenerate the head and they'll retain the classical conditioning. So uh, McConnell showed that this must mean that memories are stored outside of the brain somehow. And that was pretty controversial, but the effects were replicated a whole bunch of times. So that wasn't the real controversial one. What happened next is that he ground them up and fed them to other planarians. And he found that if you fed trained planarians to untrained planarians, the untrained ones would start to exhibit the classical conditioning. So he called this memory transfer. And that was a huge controversy because, you know, basically he's saying if you grind up planarian soup and you eat that, you absorb their memories. Uh, a lot of scientists weren't buying it. Interestingly, though, the effects did replicate. But what the people who replicated it found is that the planarians who ate untrained planarians also learned the task faster. So it seemed like they weren't absorbing memory so much as absorbing smarts. And they thought it had something to do with metabolism, maybe. That's a pretty wild story. It sounds Frankensteinian <laughs> and science fiction and, yeah. and many other things. I, I, I would have to see a really controlled experiments to, to buy the premise of it, but that's interesting. Yeah, they, they got better. Uh, there's, there's a guy, I think at Tufts University, who I'm planning to, to interview in a few months, who's been replicating this stuff. Obviously, he's not saying that they're absorbing memories, but, uh, but you can still find the classical conditioning effects. Yeah, I, I love it. And I, I'm obviously not a psychologist, so this is pretty far outside of my field, but I, I think that's fascinating and a good anecdote from history. Yeah. So your own field, ecotoxicology, what is that? This is the application of ecological principles to toxicology. So in my case, I study pollution problems around the world, uh, primarily with vulnerable communities like migrant seasonal farm workers and indigenous communities. And uh, we look at the problems in terms of what are the impacts of pollution on human health, on wildlife health, and on environmental health. Mm -hmm. Is there a technical scientific definition of pollution, or is it really just like anything that's harmful that's out there? Yeah, that's a great question. So pollutants are are chemicals that cause a health problem. So they're they're toxic to us or to animals, and they're at large enough volumes in the, in the environment or in our homes that they can induce those problems. So you could imagine that there are contaminants that are highly toxic, but we don't come into contact with them at any appreciable level. They wouldn't really be in the realm of pollution, but those things that are, that are high enough concentration that they impact us would be uh, the pollutants. Would you add unnatural to that? Because you, you could say there's a whole jungle full of like poison ivy and that would harm us, but you probably wouldn't call it pollution. Right. And, and actually, there are lots of pollutants that are naturally occurring, like mercury, mm 
um, but they are in the environment at high, at high concentrations because of human behavior. And so we're, we're burning coal, releasing that mercury into the environment. We're extracting gold from rock using mercury, releasing it into the environment. So that would be naturally occurring toxic compounds that are pollutants. And then there's all the synthetic compounds that are pollutants. And it turns out there's about 350,000 synthetic chemicals that have been produced by humans and released into the environment. So it's it's an immense problem. Mm -hmm. Is this all stuff that has emerged more or less with industrialization or are any of these pollutants like things that that earlier humans have had to deal with? There's a handful that earlier humans had to deal with. Like there's a pretty compelling hypothesis that the fall of the Roman Empire was due to lead pollution because they had lead lined pipes and lead um, lead pottery that they drank from and lead causes irreversible losses in IQ and, and irreversible increases in impulsivity and all kinds of behavioral problems. So, so it could very well be that that empire fell due to lead poisoning. That would be an early example. We know that there are other examples of early pre-industrial societies that had problems with certain toxic elements such as lead and mercury, but uh, not to the scale that we see today where, I don't know if you saw the recent study that showed that rainfall all over earth has per and polyfluoroalkyl substances in it, PFAS chemicals, which are entirely synthetic and they're everywhere on earth. And now there's new research showing that large hailstones are forming around microplastic pollution in the atmosphere. What does plastic do to us? Plastic is a very complicated matrix of things derived from fossil fuels, and there are thousands of chemicals that comprise plastic. Many of them are endocrine disrupting compounds, oftentimes estrogenic compounds. So those can can cause irreversible changes in development, like um, disruption of sexual development. Some of them are carcinogenic, so they induce um, estrogen-mediated cancers like breast cancer or testicular cancer, prostate cancer. There's a huge variety of health effects that we see with plastic exposure. So if a child swallows a plastic toy, usually if it's small enough, it'll come out the other end and they seem unharmed. So how is it being absorbed if it, if it doesn't seem like we're digesting it? That's another good question, Adam. So it, it has to do primarily with chronic exposure. So if 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 a kid accidentally swallows a plastic pellet or something like that, it's really unlikely to have any kind of adverse health consequence as long as it comes out the other end, as you say. But when we're exposed to these chemicals chronically, so over prolonged periods of time, especially during early development, during pregnancy and early childhood development, that's where we tend to see the biggest effects. What is it about that early developmental period that, that makes us more susceptible? So if you've ever studied endocrinology, you would have learned about organizational versus activational effects. And so, so organizational effects are where you have something occurring during development that if it gets changed in some way, it causes a permanent change to the trajectory of development. Activational effects are things that occur in the moment and then they're fleeting and they're over. So you could think of, for example, the flight, fight or flight response as an activational effect that we get a surge of epinephrine or adrenaline, and it causes the fight or flight response, which is over after that emergency is over, as opposed to, say, a, a, a baby in the womb that's exposed to high levels of DDT or PCBs or other estrogenic compounds, bisphenol A, and so on, that causes that baby to be born with ambiguous genitalia or undescended testes, things like that, that would be organizational effects. So if you think about it, um, if you think about something like fetal alcohol syndrome, where you have some babies that are born with permanent defects because the mother was drinking during pregnancy, it's not just how much the mother was drinking, but exactly when during pregnancy the mother was drinking, because there are certain windows of development when we're susceptible to alterations of that development. Imagine that it's during the period when the brain is rapidly developing, for example, that would be a very dangerous time to have chemical exposure. So that's the difference is when we're, when we're having development permanently altered versus you and I as adults, we would get just activational effects. So you're very knowledgeable about the individual biological effects of these pollutants, but it sounds like your research is more on like a large scale public health rather than like individual medicine type thing. 
It's actually at all levels. So we do work in my lab in, in the lab environment where we're looking at how contaminants impact everything from gene expression and protein expression and, and disruption of hormone function to developmental pathologies to changes in behavior. And then at the environmental level, we use tools such as stable isotopes to track pollutants through food webs and look at impacts on populations of wildlife, impacts on public health. So we try to take a holistic view um, using what's called a one health approach of looking at human, animal, and environmental health simultaneously, and using tools ranging from molecular biology to ecology to address these problems. How stable or variable are, are these effects? Like, would one pollutant impact humans the same way it would impact most mammals? Or like, are, are there other things like a specific type of plastic I might be immune to, but would really affect you or vice versa? I love your questions. These are terrific questions. So at one level, there's conservation of developmental systems, conservation of the hormone system, conservation of genetics across vertebrates, which means that we could look at the impact of a pollutant on a fish model or on a rodent model. And if we find effects in that animal in terms of gene expression or changes in hormones, pretty good chances we're also going to find that in humans. So there's widespread conservation. Just as one example, about 70 some odd percent of human genetic diseases, fish have the same genetic diseases. And so wow. we can look at, at the majority of those diseases in a fish model. On the other hand, we know that there's widespread variation between different individuals. And that's true in people, it's true in wildlife. So there's different susceptibility to diseases in different ethnic groups around the world, for example. There's differences based on, on an individual's genetics. And so we have to view both of those things as important. There is conservation of these systems such that effects tend to occur broadly in vertebrates. If they occur in one, they occur throughout, but there's also a lot of variation between individuals. That gets into the, mm -hmm. into the area of precision medicine once you start getting into that individual variation. When you see differences across ethnic groups, I'm, I'm guessing there are no genetic differences. So is that does that have to do with like you're raised in a certain environment, so you're more or less immune to, to different things? It's both. There's there's absolutely genetic differences. Um, just as an example, I, I'm an Ashkenazic Jew, so a Jew of Eastern European descent. And Ashkenazic Jews, French Canadians, and the Amish all have a high susceptibility to having the Tay-Sachs allele, which is a recessive um, allele that if you have both copies of the recessive allele, the, the baby dies three or four years old. It's a lethal disease. And Ashkenazic Jews are also more susceptible to certain kinds of breast cancer. So there, there are, and that's a genetic effect. And you can see the same thing with populations around the world. There's populations that lack certain enzymes that break down alcohol that make them more vulnerable to alcoholism. So there's all kinds of genetic differences between ethnic groups that drive disease states and drive vulnerability even to contaminants. Um, and then there's also cultural effects that are important because certain groups might eat a diet, for example, that makes them more or less susceptible to a certain disease. Are the genetic differences, especially when it comes to like, if, if you're at an increased likelihood for some health risk, is that ever paired with something adaptive or is it more just like an initial risk that might snowball as long as a, a group intermingles enough? It's another great question. Sometimes it's related to something adaptive and sometimes it's not. So the classic example, where it's related to something adaptive is that uh, African Americans are more susceptible to sickle cell anemia. And the reason for that is in West Africa, where most of the African Americans originally derived from the slave trade, in West Africa, there's a high frequency of an, an allele, a, a gene variety that is protective against malaria. And it, prevent, it prevents the malaria protozoan from attaching to the red blood cell. If an individual is heterozygote for that gene, so they have one normal copy of the gene and one of the mutant, mutant copies that's the recessive allele, they have protection from malaria. So it's a huge adaptive benefit. If they're homozygous uh, recessive, meaning they have both copies of the mutant allele, they have anemia, which is, which is very bad and leads to early mortality. So, but if, if you learn about something called the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, which tells you about different gene frequencies in a population, what you discover is that mo if that gene exists in the population, the vast majority of individuals who have it 
will be heterozygotes. So it provides protection to far more individuals than it does um, provide the disease state. In the in the case of of uh, uh, sickle cell anemia, you might have say 18% of the population in West Africa has protection from malaria. Um, less than 2% has the disease and 80, maybe 80% 80 is normal homozygous dominant. So that would be an example where the gene originally arose through random mutation, but then it had a benefit. And so it spread in the population. In other cases like Tay-Sachs, it, it probably doesn't have a benefit. Um, it's And it, it's totally lethal in, in young children when you have both copies of the recessive allele. There's some debate about that with Tay-Sachs or some idea that it may impart extra IQ if you are heterozygous, but I'm not sure how solid that evidence is. This is all very interesting. I'm seeing how this research combined with your interest in science history combines to give you the chemical age. Well, well, thanks. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed writing the book. It, it's it's a it's looking at a diverse set of scientific problems that have to do with the development of chemistry and how chemists were trying to stop famine, trying to stop pandemics, but at the same time developing chemicals of war and leading to widespread pollution of the environment. So it's a complex story, and it was interesting for me to write. It 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 sounds on the surface kind of spooky or morbid when we're talking about the chemical age and and there's all these things like chemical warfare but as you mentioned like tr chemists trying to treat disease or invent fertilizers that saved millions of lives why is it do you think that generally we don't we're not as aware of like the positive sides of chemistry that's a great question it's a probably a question you should ask a, a colleague of yours in psychology but i i would say that it, it's maybe one answer is that people tend to only scratch the surface of whatever a problem is. And that's especially true today when we're down to however many characters that fit into a tweet where we're not looking into things deeply. So you could take a character like Fritz Haber, for example, and you learn that he's the father of modern chemical warfare, the, that he developed the first weapon of mass destruction deployed on the battlefield, which was chlorine gas in World War I. And you think that this, this person is evil, must be a horrible person. But at the same time, this is the same man who is developing super valuable tools in public health, including the use of similar chemicals to fight typhus, uh, which was ravaging populations during wartime. And he's the same person who was the first to figure out how to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere and make artificial fertilizers, which is credited with saving a couple of billion lives during the 20th century. So with most things, once you start to dig deeper into it, you see that it's just a lot more complicated than it appears at first. The science channel Veritasium released a video on him a, a few months ago. It was titled The Man Who Killed Millions and Saved Billions. Yeah, and it's a it's a great example. I, I used Haber as a central character in my book as well because he played such a, a large role in the development of chemistry during the 150 years or so that I cover. And and he has so many controversies associated with his life that it illustrates well that history. Mm -hmm. So I guess there is a some some psychology in that because we have this negativity bias. Um, so that that could perhaps explain why when someone's done something both very great and very bad, we tend to focus on the very bad. Yeah, I, I have heard about that. And um, I think you're right. I think that's part of it. And I think that the reluctance of people to learn deeply about a subject is another part of it. I wonder how much it has to do with the thought that scientific advancements, when there's something good, they, they might think, oh, someone would have come up with that eventually because starvation is always a problem. So better ways to, to find food, like someone's going to come up with that eventually. But then maybe on the more negative end, you think that, oh, you had to be a truly sick individual emphasis on individual to come up with a novel chemical to aimed at killing people. Yeah, and so much of this comes out of accidental discovery in science. Most of these chemicals, they started out as an effort to produce dyes for coloring cloth and other, other things where you needed coloration because dyes were plant-based and very expensive. So if you could synthesize them, you could make a lot of money. And that's how organic chemistry got started in the early 
1800s, and it flourished to become the pharmaceutical industry, the chemical industry, and and all the rest. Uh, so th it's unpredictable, and 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 I think that um, that its motivations are often um, they they might be honorable, like I want to solve world hunger, but they might all be more driven by I want to be recognized for that discovery. So, so many of these scientists, mm -hmm. they were seeking acclamation for their abilities, for their science, and that was first and foremost, but they also wanted to solve problems. But then they also applied their genius to, to warfare and things like that. And another point along the lines of what you said is that it's solutions seem obvious after the fact. They're, they're certainly not obvious before the fact, or they would have been come up with a long time ago. And, you know, how long were we all carrying our duffel bags with huge amounts of weight over our shoulders before some genius thought of let's put wheels on them. That happened, uh -huh. you know, 30 years ago. It's not that long ago. And yet that should have happened a thousand years ago if it's really that obvious. You know, the wheels, I, I would hope that I could have figured out, but but I'm very ignorant of chemistry. So how how is it that you can have more or less the same substance that on one hand is like this used for chemical warfare and the, on the other hand is used to create food that we can eat and wouldn't kill us in the same way that that the chemicals would. Yeah, so uh, just a good example of explaining that is uh, the Nazi scientist Gerhard Schrader. He was looking for an effective insecticide during World War II in order to boost crop production because there was widespread hunger in Germany during World War II. And in the process of developing new categories of organic chemistry, he was adding atoms to carbon-based structures. So when you say organic, it means it's a carbon-based skeleton to the molecule. He was adding various things to it. And he created this class of chemicals called organophosphates. He thought he had arrived at a really good insecticide because they were highly toxic to insects. But when, when they tested them on laboratory mammals, they found that actually they're highly lethal, in fact, highly lethal to people. And this became the first German nerve, nerve gas agent, which was called Tabin. And a year later, he invented another one called Sarin, uh, which uh, was then the most toxic chemical weapon ever developed. After World War II, he continued to develop organophosphates, but for agriculture and finding ways to change the structures so that they wouldn't be lethal or even very toxic necessarily to people, but they could be used against insects. So. The biochemistry of it is a bit complicated because you have to get into things like inhibition of neurotransmitters in the brain. So um, a lot of these chemicals are inhibitors of, of acetylcholinesterase. And so by by preventing the, the enzymes activity that breaks down acetylcholine, it leads to this synaptic overcharge where the synapsis doesn't stop turning on. And that causes their neurological outcome that leads to death very rapidly. Um, so a lot of these act in that way. And, and so you can change the molecular, molecular structure so that they're no longer inhibiting acetylcholinesterase in mammals, but they can still do a similar thing in insects, which have a different structure to their enzymes. Are most synthetic substances functionally inert and it takes something very specific to kill us? Or is it more like we what what we would survive is something very specific that nature has crafted and anything outside of that could very easily kill us? That's a great question. So earlier you brought up what's the difference between these synthetic poisons and whether they're those are pollutants versus naturally occurring ones. So if I bring this conversation back to plants, uh, plants can't run away from their predators, right? They're stuck in place. And so plants have developed, they've evolved chemicals that impart protection to them. And, and you can you can break down plant chemicals. There's There's kind of two broad categories. One would be primary chemicals, which are involved in the growth of the plant. And another category of chemicals plants to, plants have evolved to have are called secondary compounds, which are compounds that either make the plant poorly digestible like tannins or make the plant toxic like cyanide. And so there are many deadly compounds out there. Uh, just think about the mushrooms and the various, various plants that produce deadly compounds that are deadly to us. And those are the way the plant has to protect itself from its predators. Most of the predators of plants are insects, but mammals are also predators of plants. And so that's their defense mechanism. 
that's a good for us in the sense that about half of Western medicines are derived from plant secondary compounds. So we take advantage of those poisons to kill things that are damaging to us, but it, they are, they're also deadly compounds. They come in all different kinds of chemical shapes and sizes and structures. So there's not an easy way to answer your question. And the same thing with synthetic chemicals. We now have, as I mentioned, about 350,000 synthetic chemicals that are out in the environment at fairly large quantities. And their toxicity varies from not toxic at all to highly toxic, depending on, on the structure. Here's maybe a, a way of rewording it. If you took something edible, like a vegetable, and then genetically or chemically modified it, whatever you needed to do, would you, if you changed it just a little bit from something that is food, would it then become poisonous pretty easily? Or would you need to make very specific changes in order for it to be poisonous? It would be the latter. It'd be very specific changes. And there's a lot of changes you could make, but they're not simple to make. And, and so, uh, for example, these organophosphate nerve gas agents, these are chemicals that don't occur in nature. It takes a lot of advanced chemistry to make them. And the science hadn't advanced enough to make them until the World War II era. So it, it's not an easy process. Yeah, I'm, I'm struggling to understand whether I think it would be more or less likely for something like this to be harmful for us because on one hand you could say like whatever is most deadly you would expect to find in nature because nature is where life evolves and where life is trying to kill each other but then on the other hand you could use that argument to say what it, we're prepared for what's natural but we're unprepared for what isn't natural yeah that's exactly right and so if you look at what happens in our bodies when we consume something when it's something from a plant, our chances of dealing with it are much higher than if it's a synthetic compound because we've evolved mechanisms to break those compounds down in our liver. Now, there's some things we can't, right? There's some chemicals in plants and in mushrooms and other organisms that are deadly and, and we don't have the ability to detoxify them. But there's all kinds of compounds that we do have that ability, right? We can drink tea and we can handle the tannins. Um, they're, they make it a little less digestible, but it doesn't hurt us. And uh, but when it comes to these synthetic compounds that are deadly, like uh, Novichok that the Soviets and now the Russians have used as chemical weapons, those don't occur in nature, and they we don't have the ability to detoxify them. What is going on when the plant defense backfires, like when it produces something like caffeine or nicotine, and then it turns out that people like that? Well, keep in mind that these are chemicals that evolved to, to combat against insect pests. Mm -hmm. So, so people really aren't part of the story. We don't consume enough of these plants that they would have a pressure on them to evolve in response to people. But you imagine, uh, ants, for example, a single leaf cutter ant colony can have 7 million individuals in it. And they're out there harvesting the leaves and the flowers constantly. They can denude an entire rainforest tree of its leaves in one day. And so the pressure is intense to, to evolve chemicals to protect against that. So that, that's the reason why it, if it's hard for an animal to digest, then they can't eat as much of it. And in fact, if you look at the behavior of say tropical rainforest monkeys, they don't eat the same plant all the time. They, they'll, they'll eat a little bit of a lot of different kinds of plants. And that's because it's difficult for them to digest the secondary compounds of so much of one chemical all at once. So they have to have a diverse diet. So it does provide quite a lot of protection. And another way to think about it is the plant secondary compounds that are designed that that have evolved to prevent plant predation, the 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 ones that reduce digestibility like tannins are relatively inexpensive for the plant to produce and they produce them in vast quantities. The ones that are highly toxic like cyanide are very energetically expensive to produce and they produce in small quantities. Mm -hmm. What about with mushrooms like when some because mushrooms on the surface seem pretty similar. So I'm imagining the selection pressures are somewhat similar. Why are some perfectly happy being eaten and others are highly toxic? Because as, as you mentioned, it takes a lot of energy investment to create the toxins, right? That's right. So so mushrooms are, what you're seeing when you see a mushroom is just the, the spore producing body of the organism. Most of that organism is underground. And when it's ready to reproduce, it sends a mushroom up and it has the, the spores then on, on, on or in that body. So those are not actually very 
expensive to produce. They come up really fast, they grow fast, and 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 they're producing spores. But that organism it is also producing toxins to prevent itself from being eaten when it's reproducing, which is what the mushroom is all about. And so it also has these protective chemicals there uh, so that it can complete its life cycle. So to tie this back to the book a little bit, when we're talking about fertilizer um, or synthetic chemicals that um, in insecticides, uh, on one hand, we get way more food out of using that. On the other hand, is the food that we're eating then more dangerous? So we have to break this down into just two separate questions. One would be around the fertilizers. The other would be around the pesticides. Sure. With regard to fertilizers, using fertilizers does not make the food more dangerous. What you're adding is nitrogen and phosphorus to the soil. And it is impacting the environment because we are we humans now fix more nitrogen through fixation from the, from the atmosphere to make fertilizers and through nitrogen fixing crops that we grow than all of nature does. Which what is do a remark. So nitrogen, 80% of the atmosphere is, is nitrogen gas. And we chemically, using pressure, temperature, and catalyst, we we are able to chemically capture that nitrogen gas and turn it into nitrogen fertilizer. Um, and and then it can be used. You can't just take gas out of the atmosphere and grow crops with it. You have to make it into a a, a chemical that uh, where you've combined that with oxygen and 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 Usually we're bringing phosphorus in too and making a fertilizer. So that that is disruptive of ecological processes because what happens is we end up releasing a lot of this fertilizer from farming areas into the environment, which causes fish kills, eutrophication of water. It causes um, toxic algal blooms, so things like red tide events. So there's an environmental cost to it, but that food that you grow with the fertilizer is perfectly safe to eat. There's no difference between eating that food and food that's naturally fertilized. The mm -hmm. second part of that is pesticides. So pesticides are any chemicals that we use to kill pests. And so if it's insect pests, that would be insecticides. If it's plant pests, that's herbicides. If it's rodent pests, that's rodenticides. Those typically are toxic to us as well. And so we are potentially getting residues of those chemicals in our food if, if too much of the pesticide is used, if a long lasting pesticide is used, if, we, if the food is harvested too early and so on. See underneath this question, and I'm sure you get this a lot when talking about your book, there's a huge pressure to ask like, okay, but is it a net good or a net loss? And like, if it's a net good, we should do more of it. And if it's a net loss or a net harm, then, um, then we should do less of it. Uh, but it seems like it's very, very complicated. Yeah, I, I, this goes actually back to psychology. So I could turn the question around on you a little bit, but yeah. what I would say is that humans have a tendency when we have a new tool to overuse it. And you can certainly see that with pesticides. Like when DDT was first uh, discovered as an insecticide in 1939, and then implemented by the US into the war theater to fight typhus, malaria, and yellow fever beginning in 1942, 1943, it was an incredibly effective public health tool. And we were able to stop, for example, a typhus outbreak in its traps, in its tracks in, in Naples in 1944, as the US military moved its way up uh, fighting the Nazis out of, out of Italy. But then as soon as the war ended, we used DDT in such vast quantities all over the world that the insect pests evolved resistance to it. And it was no longer effective as a public health tool. That's the story with one pesticide after another. So I think the answer to your question is really psychological. If we had a way to be using these tools at a prudent level, they would be very important tools to public health, important tools for agriculture, but we overuse them. And that, re that requires us to use more of them and constantly develop new ones over time. So another way to put this is when Rachel Carson, she published her book, Silent Spring in 1962, which was alerting the world to the to the dangers of pesticide and pesticides and how they were wiping out wildlife all over the world and causing all kinds of human health problems. By the end of the 1990s, globally, we were using about twice as much volume of pesticides as we were in 1962 when she really initiated the modern environmental movement. So that, that's kind of a depressing fact. And it just shows that we we take these wonderful tools and we overuse them. This sounds very related to antibiotics, which have saved millions of lives, but people warn that maybe we're overusing them and then that it runs the risk of 
like super bacteria, who are, which are resistant to antibiotics uh, evolving. Do you, is there such a thing as super pests that we're worried about? Yeah, so it's, it's not maybe we're overusing antibiotics. There's no doubt that we're overusing antibiotics and by a massive amount. And uh, and so, and you can see the same thing during this COVID era where we overuse the various things that we use to sterilize surfaces. And this has gone on even till today where there's constant, we're cleaning and sterilizing, even though we've known for a long time now that COVID is, is almost exclusively transmitted through respiration is not through contact on surfaces. So this this just goes back to the psychology again, where we're, we're just not thinking in a smart way about our use of these tools. So going to your question about superbugs, yeah, there's a lot of devastating insect pests that, uh, that have evolved resistance to these chemicals that we use because of our overuse. And what we really need to be doing in agriculture is something called integrative pest management where we have diverse crops, we use biological control like spiders and birds and and um, and uh, parasitic wasps and so on that can that can kill insect pests. And we only use chemicals sparingly and only where absolutely needed in order to control outbreaks just where they're getting started. And what you were saying about sanitation, I th I think I've definitely been sanitizing my hands far more since COVID, even, even now that it's mostly over uh, than I ever did pre-COVID. I've been wondering about what that might do sort of at two levels, because on one hand, there's sort of the societal level, which is maybe there's just more highly resistant germs that are going to evolve since we're killing them. And then on the other hand, there's like the, the more individual level, especially with children, because playing in the mud and getting dirty is what builds up your immune system, right? Yeah, that's right. You're asking such wonderful questions. So yes, first of all, on the, on all the sanitation, I think it's I think it's a mistake. There's certain places that we have to do it, like in hospitals where we need to prevent transmission of diseases from patient to patient. But we over sanitize our homes, we over sanitize our workplaces, and that can lead to the evolution of of bacteria and other other um, problematic microorganisms that are that have evolved resistant to those sanitizing agents. It also has an environmental impact because these chemicals that we use to sanitize, they don't just kill the bacteria that we're targeting. They also damage wildlife. They they also get into our streams and rivers and they harm fish and they harm aquatic organisms. So there's an ecological cost to all of this. And, and unfortunately, this is another psychological problem. This, as society, we tend to focus on one thing at a time or maybe two or three, but we can't think holistically through what are the downstream impacts of all of this? Or another example would be these at-home COVID tests that, that we've all been taking. Look at the incredible amount of packaging that goes into these. We use them once, we throw them away. They're full of plastic and chemical reagents, which mm -hmm. are not getting disposed of and responsibly. They're just going to the landfill. And we don't think right. what's going to happen with these billions of test kits ending up in our landfills. How will that impact the environment? Um, so it, these are, these are, big problems that we don't think about enough. Wow. That's the first time I've ever heard, heard a criticism of that, but wow, that that's making me think. So yeah, how so about, how about um, with the building up your immune system? Like, could you make a counter argument that perhaps if we're exposed to more toxins, it's going to force us to become more resilient. And then maybe that's like a net good. Yeah. Let's go back to that question about that. So, so, you know, there's far more, organisms, microorganisms living in us that are symbiotic with us than there are human cells. So there's all these bacteria and, and fungi and so on that are, that are symbiotic, our, our, our microbiome that's in our, it's in our gut, it's in our mouth, it's, it's in the nose, it's in the eyes, it's everywhere. And we're learning more and more about it. And it turns out these play a hugely important role in, in human health. Um, and so if we go back to your point earlier, that if you have a child that's no longer playing in the dirt, will it develop, will that child develop uh, a healthy microbiome? And there, there's a lot of evidence that we need that kind of environment. But even before that, there's great research now that looks at the microbiome that develops when a baby is born uh, from a vaginal delivery versus born with C-section. And that baby born with a C-section is that already a disadvantage because the mother through her vaginal microbiome and also uh, through through the feces microbiome that 
the baby's exposed to during delivery is getting is getting the mother's microbiome, which is seeding this really important part of our of our health. And so babies born by C-section are already at a disadvantage. There's people looking at how can we clinically treat C-section babies to impart on them this microbiome from the mother? How can we make it kind of a dirtier C-section in order to make a healthier baby? Mm-hmm. So these these are big, important questions that uh, we're just learning a lot more about now with, with the last 10 years or so of research on microbiome and it's constant, it's fast moving field, very important. And I am worried about that with our overuse of antibiotics. We're damaging our microbiome with, with, um, there's a lot of research showing with things like ear infections that children recover just as fast without an antibiotic as they do with an antibiotic. But what you're doing is damaging the child's microbiome. So, so there's cases where we need it. You know, uh, you can get an infection where you have to have an antibiotic or you're, you will die. You can have deadly infections. But we definitely overuse these things, whether it's sanitation, antibiotics, um, all, all of these things we've just been discussing. So could you say that if you were overusing them and if you were then exposing yourself to like more resistant bacteria, then your immune system would have to work to fight stronger bacteria? So is is there any ever a case where you could end up with like a stronger immune system precisely because you've overexposed yourself? So, so here I'm not talking about like playing in the mud and getting the healthier sort of low level germs. I'm talking about if you got the more extreme germs that we're worried about, could, could you then uh, sort of evolve a, a more hardened response to that? Unfortunately, probably not because what happens when we take something like an antibiotic that's killing most of it might wipe out 99% of the bacteria in our gut microbiome, for example, is we're, we're tending to lose many of the highly beneficial species of bacteria that we need in order to be healthy. And so that might lead to more of an inflammatory response and a variety of different disease states. Um, even things like obesity, like there's been, um, cases where, there was a fecal transplant um, from a person who was obese to a person who was thin, and the microbiome from the obese person made, then made the thin person become obese. So microbiome, just they just play this such a big role in our health that we we don't understand very well. But I I think what you're what you're asking about is super unlikely to occur. That the detrimental effects to our health of losing that that healthy microbiome are are, are really quite large, and that's why. Uh, you know, I, I'm 55. I grew up taking a lot of antibiotics because that's the age I was. Whenever you got an ear infection, you got antibiotics. And, and so then you have to do things like, okay, what, what can I do to take probiotics and the food for the probiotics in order to um, have a healthy microbiome? We should all be doing these kinds of things. I'm not an expert on it, but, um, but it, it is important. Are, so they're not a scam then, is that right? <laughs> Well, so so there there is a problem where uh, food supplements are not regulated in the United States, and so you don't know what you're getting, and you don't know the quality of it as you do with drugs, right? So drugs have to go through the FDA process that's very rigorous of testing their safety and efficacy. That's not true for the food supplement business. So with supplements like probiotics, you just have to find a really reputable source to make sure you're getting the right thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't rely on claims because none of it is is regulated. So if, if something is very mildly toxic, what determines whether we build up an immunity to it or whether it's just one of those things that it chips away at you and the more prolonged exposure you have, the worse you get? Well, if it's if it's a biological infection like COVID, then that can trigger the immune response and, and we can all develop immunity to it. So I just had COVID and August. And so I probably have pretty good protection for a while on top of the vaccine. I I had it after having the vaccine, but, but that gives me good protection for a while. That's we've evolved to um, have robust immune response to biological infections. When it comes to chemical exposures, it's quite different because then we're talking about, does our body have the ability to detoxify that, which could occur through breaking the molecule down or possibly through attaching something to that molecule that makes it water soluble so we can urinate it out or possibly attaching something to it that makes it sequestered and no longer toxic. Those are all things that exist in our body. But um, whether 
we have that ability often depends on whether it's a novel chemical, novel being synthetic or man-made. With the man-made chemicals, we often have no natural ability to do those things because it's something that our, our evolutionary past never encountered. And does that apply to pesticides as well? It applies to pesticides. Most pesticides are synthetic and and so they're they're man-made and and we do not have much of an ability. Some of them we we can, we have some ability to break down, but uh, but not to the extent we do with naturally occurring uh, chemicals that are, say, similarly toxic. Here's where some folk psychology can come into play again, and may- maybe to the to the detriment of some people's health, because there's kind of this intuition of like, okay, let's let's assume that eating food that has residual pesticide is bad for me. But then it's like, well, if I get used to it, then I'll get used to it and it'll stop being bad for me. Yeah, so that's not the case, um, <laughs> uh, right? We we have the idea we can get used to uh, uh, loud noises. So, for example, one of my best friends grew up in the Bronx, and he he grew up in this super urban, noisy environment. And I took him out to our family's cabin on a on a weekend in the middle of the forest and in this very quiet area. There's no noises at all except for the occasional owl. He couldn't sleep at all. He couldn't sleep a wink. And he was so used to this background noise that he couldn't sleep. I'm the other way around. I grew up in Alaska. And if I go to the city, I have trouble sleeping because of all the background noise. So that's the psychological adjustment, right, that, uh-huh. that we can make. But that's not the same thing as if you're exposed to uh, these chemicals, where typically the higher the level of exposure, the bigger the detriment to to one's health. Uh-huh. And uh, your body your body doesn't get used to it. Um, it, it doesn't work in the same way. So please tell me if this is a myth, that if you expose yourself to a very tiny amount of snake venom, and then you start upping the dosage over time, do you become immune to it? I cannot answer that question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, but um, it would. there's a lot of different kinds of snake venom. So mm-hmm. um, there are many different chemical compounds in snake venom. And so my guess is that um, that our ability to break down snake venom will depend very much on the chemical composition, which kind it is. Some snakes are entirely deadly. When 1988, I spent a semester uh, learning tropical ecology in Costa Rica. And while I was there, there were eight people in the country, not people I knew, but eight people in the country who were bit by... Um, by uh, uh, this particular kind of pit viper there that's that's very toxic. Seven of them died. So this is a snake where your chances of dying if you get bit by it are, are just super high. Um, I doubt with something like that, there's anything you could do to prevent that kind of toxic response. Uh-huh. So there's there seems to be this, this cutoff point where you can maybe develop a resistance, at least if we're talking about a biological toxin up to a point and then maybe it's, there's there's a point at which it just overwhelms your defenses. I think it's probably more likely the other way around. Like for example, if you're someone who you can brush up against poison ivy and not have a skin reaction, and that's you know some people don't react to poison ivy, some people react to the slightest amount. If you're someone who won't react to poison ivy and you keep showing off, I can touch it, I don't react. You're going to increase your sensitivity to poison ivy over time. And so you'll end up reacting more easily over time, the more exposure you have to it. So I think in most cases, that is probably the opposite of what you're thinking, but I I don't know enough about it for these naturally occurring toxins to tell you more than that. Could we talk about some of your work that focuses on like specific populations that are at risk, whether that's those are minority groups or like specific areas that are that are um maybe disadvantaged or closer to pollutants? Like how does how does the distribution of this stuff work when we're talking about um, these toxins impact on, on health across the United States or across the world? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So I work primarily with indigenous populations around the world. And just as an example, I work with uh, two different tribes in Alaska where we have, we have problems that most people aren't aware of with regard to uh, toxic chemicals. There's a process called global distillation where chemicals that are used primarily in low latitudes or equatorial regions, temperate regions like pesticides, they volatize, they evaporate into the atmosphere. Mm 
And over time, they work their way to the two poles, the North Pole and the South Pole, where because it's cold year round, they, they deposit in precipitation and then they're stuck there. They're, the, the, the two poles act as hemispheric sinks for these persistent organic pollutants. So that means that, that for certain categories of pollutants, since this is specifically the light to medium molecular weight persistent organic pollutants, the highest levels on earth are, are in the Arctic. Um, they're higher in the Arctic than the Antarctic because most of the world's land mass is in the Northern Hemisphere. And so most of the use of these chemicals is in the Northern Hemisphere. They get incorporated into the food web. These chemicals are also fat soluble and Arctic animals are very high in body fat because of the perpetually cold temperatures. So, and these chemicals, they bioaccumulate, which means that as an animal grows and ages, its levels get higher and higher as it accumulates in their fat. They also biomagnify, which means that they go up in concentration from prey to predator. So the animals with the highest levels of these pollutants on earth are apex level predators like the polar bear, and killer whales that are eating seals, which are eating the fish, which are eating the smaller fish, which are eating the zooplankton. And in the Arctic, we have indigenous populations that are eating these marine mammals. They're eating the whales, they're eating the ice seals, they're even eating the polar bears. And every single meal that they have, they're eating the animal fat that has hundreds of parts per billion PCBs in it that has super high levels of mercury, super high levels of DDT. And by so comparison, getting... how much are we eating on average? If, if we so, here? Yeah, so by comparison, the EPA guidance for, for avoiding PCBs as a cancer-causing chemical in food is one and a half parts per billion. And almost all of the food we eat is well below one and a half parts per billion. They're eating meals with hundreds of parts per billion PCBs wow. on a daily basis. So there's that problem. And I study that problem, but on top of that, I look at local sources of pollution in the Arctic. So during the Cold War, Alaska, right up against the Soviet Union, you know, the closest you can get between the United States and the Soviet Union are an Alaskan island and a Russian island that are five kilometers apart. So really, really close. And and so the coastline of Alaska is just lined with these over the horizon radar installations and rocket facilities from the Cold War. And those facilities, they've mostly closed down now, and they've been replaced by satellite technology and more modern technology. But when the military pulled out of them, they left behind this legacy of pollutants, of lots of PCBs, lots of petroleum products, lots of pesticides, flame retarded chemicals. And many of those sites are in indigenous villages. So we look at pollution coming from those sites and how it impacts the health of people and wildlife in those communities. So really two important sources of pollution. There's thousands of these military sites in the Arctic and Alaska, there's about 600 of them. And um, those are important local sources of pollution along with po petroleum extraction sites and mining sites and, and various other uh, local sources of pollution. And based on everything we just talked about, about not really being able to develop resistance to these synthetic chemicals, it's not like they're gonna be adapted to it. They're just straight up worse health they're, they're straight up worse health. And if you think about how does adaptation work, adaptation works over many thousands of generations through the process of evolution. Now that can happen in our gut microbiome in a matter of a week, right? Because they're turning over every few hours. That can happen in insect populations in a few years. But for humans, it takes thousands of years to evolve resistance to something if it can happen at all. So yeah, they are in in poorer health, life expectancy is lower, cancer rates are higher for many different reasons, not just pollution exposure, but that's one of the reasons that they have very high exposure to these certain classes of persistent organic pollutants. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna present two extremes on the environmental um, conservation spectrum. So on the extreme conservationist end, you might have like, we need radical intervention now because these animals need protection from the uh, radical changes we're making to their environments. And then uh, someone else who's more like an, an extreme survival of the fittest mindset might say something like, the fittest animals are going to survive, so we should just leave them to it and they're either going to adapt or not adapt. I'm guessing both of those are wrong in some way, but, but to what extent should we expect the animals to be like making actually actually adapting to our new environments. 
Yeah, I think that second, uh, the second idea is whatever will survive will survive is just an awful and unethical response that some people have, because essentially it says, let's just live in a world of cockroaches and rats, which is what's going to survive all of this. Um, we have what are called planetary boundary threats going on, which are human changes to the environment that are exceeding the planet's capacity to, to deal with it. One of these is climate change. Another of these is uh, stratospheric ozone depletion. Another one is is nitrification of the biosphere. But an important one of this one of these is chemical pollution. If we just take the polar bear example, if you look at any polar bear in the world, it's having an impact. Uh, the pollution that it experiences is massively impacting its immune function. And polar bears are basically sick. They're sick everywhere because of this pollution. They they have uh, high infant mortality. They have um, a, a lot of diseases that they wouldn't normally get because their immune system is compromised by these chemicals. Their endocrine system is compromised. They're having uh, developmental pathologies in their offspring. So we we are facing a biodiversity crisis now where, uh, where it, it's just, it's unparalleled in during during human history. There's nothing nothing like it where we have half of all bat species at risk of extinction, half of all primate species at risk of extinction, uh, amphibians and reptiles in our global decline, even insects, which you know people generally don't like. It's a tiny fraction of insects that are pests, probably less than one percent of insect species are pests. But we're seeing a global loss of insects around the world at, that's that's massive. So the biodiversity crisis, in my mind, is the number one crisis on the planet. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of reasons for it. Uh, chemical pollution is one of the drivers of global loss of insects and other species. Um, habitat loss, you know, in in on land, it's usually converting natural environments to agriculture, and in the ocean, it's pollution that's driving these changes. So so we really face massive systemic changes to our planet that are impacting the ability of all life to survive here and 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 we have to be we have to be changing our behavior we have to become sustainable and we're nowhere near sustainable does biodiversity matter independently of like the the number of animals in a given ecosystem for example i learned there are like 8000 or more species of crab and well, that really surprised me. I didn't know it was nearly that as many. So like, let's say there were the same number of crabs, but there were only 4,000 species. On one hand, you would say half the biodiversity is wiped out. So it sounds terrible, but 4,000 is still a lot. And they would probably make up the numbers and that would equalize. So yeah, what am I missing a, there? It's a good question. So to put it in perspective, there's a little less than 5,000 species of mammals on the planet. There's about half a million species of beetles on the planet. So one way to approach this question would be to say, um, on an ethical side, it's unethical to lose any species. And so there, there's that. But if you ignore the ethics and you all you care about is humanity and the future of humanity, then your question comes down to, is there redundancy in that ecosystem such that if we lose species X, we won't lose an important ecosystem function because species Y can step into that role? Mm -hmm. And this this is actually a question that ecologists have been looking at for decades and and so one way to look at it is the more species you have in an ecosystem the more likely it is that when you lose a species you won't lose an important ecological role because there's redundancy there's some other species that's also fulfilling that role whether it be seed dispersal or pollination or something else that we need for, for our survival. So yes, it does matter how many species there are just purely from a selfish point of view. And then another purely selfish point of view that matters is that I mentioned earlier, about half of our medicines are derived from plant chemicals. There's unknown, unknown incredible quantities of future medicines that could be developed from plant chemicals that we have no idea are out there. Also from chemicals like toxins from snakes and frogs and, and chemicals from insects and so on. And so our potential to deal with future threats on this planet, health threats, also depends on preserving biodiversity. And then there's a the whole energy side and and food side where the biodiversity will play an important role of that. You know, we rely on monocultures of many of our crops. And imagine you have a disease come through, like I wrote about the potato blight in my book that wiped out the, the potatoes of Ireland and caused over a million Irish to die 
during the pandemic, uh, during the, the famine, and over a million Irish to emigrate from Ireland. If you're relying on a single or just a couple of varieties of, of crops, you're really susceptible to those kinds of pathogens coming and wiping out your food base. If you have a diversity of crops, like the average Incan farmer had over 200 varieties of potatoes on a single plot of land, you're really unlikely to suffer those kinds of, of famines. So from many, I could go on and on, from many different selfish perspectives, we rely on a healthy biodiversity and we're really damaging that biodiversity. You mentioned that this biodiversity crisis is our greatest threat. What are you most optimistic about on the environmental health or the technology front? I would say the thing I'm most optimistic about is, is that since many of these problems are tied together, a solution in one area can also really solve multiple areas. So for example, the thing that your generation is putting the most attention on, on in the environment, I would say is climate change. And there's a lot of passion about it, which is awesome. In order to solve climate change, we have to do a lot of things. So one thing we have to do is have, have um, clean sources of energy that are not releasing pollutants into the atmosphere that are greenhouse gases. Well, by doing that, let's say that the dirtiest, the dirtiest fuel is coal. Coal is not only producing carbon dioxide that's causing greenhouse warming, but it's also putting a lot of other pollutants into the atmosphere, including mercury. So by getting rid of coal, we're solving major air pollution problem. It's also reducing these small particulates of pollutants that are toxic for us and toxic for animals. To solve climate change, we have to preserve the world's rainforest because they're absorbing carbon from the atmosphere. So to solve climate change, we can also solve much of the biodiversity crisis. So that's just one example, but we, we really, if we look at these problems holistically and we solve them with a major investment of new technologies and new ways of thinking, we will simultaneously address other problems. Frank, this has been extremely informative. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks for having me on your show.